morning. Scott Sigrist here. Uh, we are here now to do our uh, second lecture on Eric Vogelin's Hitler and the Germans, um, chapter two. I am up early trying to take care of this before the kid wakes up, so um, hopefully the coffee is kicked in sufficiently for me to have uh, uh, the sufficient energy for this. Uh, we'll we'll see. Um, quick recap of chapter one. Um, Vogelin ha uh, was was gave a kind of overview of um, political science, how to do political science, um, and then um, launched into the current study. So let me do a quick recap. Um, in terms of political science, um, Vogelin's presupposition is that. The aim of political science is to understand political reality, and political reality is best understood in terms of people's experiences, uh, people's political experiences, or all the experiences that feed into political life, right? And um, key to understanding this is to understand the symbols people use, the way they talk about uh, their experiences, um, uh, and talk about what uh, what, what uh, their society means, how they think about society, uh, right? Um, and um, he understands the scientific enterprise, enterprise of political science, to be first establishing the problem or the theoretical problematic, as he calls it, right? And he says, uh, for us, this is Hitler and the Germans, nothing more, nothing less than Hitler and the Germans. Um, Secondly, uh, he uh, says we need to diagnose the problem, and for this we need to develop the uh, appropriate diagnostic tools, right? The method that's appropriate to the subject matter, and um, and ultimately the aim here is to get down to the causes of the problem that we're investigating, and then third, um, prognosis and prescription, right? Again, all this kind of on the analogy of a physician doctor, um, we, we want to uh, get a sense of the trajectory of the problem, and particularly he's concerned with how uh, uh, people, uh, Germans in the 1960s, tended to be influenced by uh, uh, what happened, um, and most disturbingly, uh, attitudes or orientations that uh, Vogelin thinks have not changed. Uh, and that Germans need to come to terms with. Um, and then pres prescription uh, has to do with, uh, you know, well, what, what can we do about this problem? Uh, what kind of therapy do we need to uh, get over this uh, illness that we have? Uh, and then going into the current study, um, he starts with the present, right? Problems in the present that, um, we need to uh, address, uh, need to begin with, to um, deal with the past, right? And he mentions um, this, this phenomenon called, he calls the Buttermelker Syndrome. I have a hard time saying it, Buttermelker, um, um, which is the idea that uh, this guy Buttermelker couldn't believe that uh, a, a large portion, a majority uh, of, of German society could um, be uh, misguided enough to actually uh, understand who Hitler was and, and to follow him. Um, and so this, this phenomenon, um, the loss of moral language or the Germans' inability to talk about uh, the, what happened in, uh, in adequate moral language, right, and then the failure of political scientists to get past the surface of what happened, right? And the larger issue, and he says, uh, you know, it's, it comes down to that um, that subject matter, political science, uh, the experiences of the German people, and uh, the, the so the problem is experiential, um, and the problematic is Hitler's rise to power. Um, and uh, more specifically, he began uh, in chapter two to um, express this theoretical problematic in terms of representation, 
how could the Germans allow a man like Hitler to represent them? Uh, and in what sense or in what way did he represent them? And also perhaps who did he represent um, in German society? Um, so, um, so, well then, um, Berglin goes into developing his diagnostic tools. Um, and as uh, was touched on in the first lecture, uh, he considers the first challenge to be replacing cliches in the way people have talked about uh, the subject matter uh, with scientific con uh, concepts. Um, that is, he's addressing the language problem. Um, the, the symbols people have used um, in uh, aren't trying to understand the problem are uh, not adequate. Uh, they're not clarifying. Uh, they're actually an obstacle to seeing things clearly. Right, and he takes up a few of these. Um, so um, the first one is uh, this: the unmastered past. It's the way a lot of Germans had talked about it. We need to master this past of what happened to us. And um, Berglin, uh, Berglin suggests that this is, this is a, um, a misleading concept. We can't master the past. We can only master the present. And through mastering the present, understand the past, right? And, and so he says, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the way to understand this, um, the, the starting point is the presence under God, as the way he puts it, right? Um, it sounds strange, um, uh, so let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, he, he, he thinks understanding um, the problem in terms of the presence under God uh, both clarifies the task at hand and provides a criterion for judging. It's so one of the critical things in um, um, trying to uh, make uh, intelligent scientific judgments is what are your standards for judging the matter, for coming to your conclusions? What are the criterion uh, by which you're coming to your conclusions, right? Or what you're appealing to and coming to your conclusions. And he says the, stat, the, the, the standard is the present as well as the permanent order of existence under God. Um, uh, he understands uh, God, uh, as he puts it in another place, eternal being in time, right? There's, a, there, there's an unchanging standard, but the unchanging standard is not just abstract uh, principles, but it's something concrete. It's the divine presence. Now this, this, this sounds strange to us today uh, it sounds strange. It sounded strange to people then, um, because it sounds like a religious standard, and we um, we we don't we don't see this uh, typically as scientific at all. Uh, but we we will have to. He he, he develops uh, what he's saying in the course of this chapter and in the course of the uh, series of lectures that he's giving here. Um, and um, you know so. Um, I'd say for the moment, um, table your judgments and your um, skepticism, uh, and um, wait, wait till you see what what he what he means by this um, more specifically before you dismiss it out of hand. Um, the big obstacle to recognizing this standard, he thinks, is modern ideologies. There's a uh, a distinct secularistic tendency, um, if not a dominant a tendency, in uh, modern science. And, um, and, and ideology itself is not only a problem um, in relation to Hitler, but it's a problem in relation to understanding Hitler. People's ideological uh, hang-ups, um, prisms, lenses, however you want to put that, um, which, uh, which, which, which Vogelin reads as kind of replacements for religion, kind of secular religion, if you will. 
Well, we'll, we'll, we'll delve into all that more in, in depth later. Um, the second cliche uh, is the concept of collective guilt. Uh, people were talking about collective guilt uh, of the German people. Uh, and uh, and and Bogdan um, Bogdan says that's 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 not helpful either. What we need to uh, really be um, honing in on is this question of representation um, as a more concrete standard. I mean, first of all, um, there is no such thing, Bogdan says, as collective responsibility. Responsibility is always personal. Um, guilt is always personal. And the central question is one of personal responsibility and personal obligations here. But in a way, collective guilt gets you off the hook. Uh, you talk about collective guilt, uh, you don't look within and consider uh, to what extent have I been part of the problem? Um, to what extent uh, is there something about me that's preventing me from coming to terms with the problem? Right. So personal responsibility. In terms of representation, Bogle suggests that there are three kinds of representation. And we, we think of representation, we think of representative government, where uh, you elect people into office. Um, but Bogle suggests that there's, there's much more to the, um, the idea of representation than that, and it's the understanding this is critical to, to getting at um, this question of, of Hitler's representativeness uh, in the in the in German society at the time, right? So there are three kinds of representation. Bogdan says the elemental. I don't know if he brings that up here in these lectures, but elsewhere he does. There's elemental elemental uh, representation, uh, which is the process by which a ruler comes to act on behalf of the people. Um, and this can be democratic, but it can be in other other ways. Uh, you know, in a monarchy, it might be hereditary, but uh, but in some ways, uh, the ruler uh, represents the people elementary, elementally, in the sense of of how he uh, comes to act on behalf of the people. And in Hitler's case, this was democratic at first, right? He was elected by 13 million people. Um, before he began to consolidate his power. Um, the second kind of representation is existential, Bogdan calls it. Uh, and this is, this is the kind of representation where you reflect the character of society, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, how representative of, are you of society in terms of mirroring uh, what society is, right, the people in your society are. And then the third uh, kind of representation, Bogdan calls transcendental. And this is representing justice, representing more specifically, representing and mediating a higher moral and spiritual order. Right. So Hitler, uh, he wants to suggest uh, just um, at the beginning here uh, in outline, uh, truly represented the Germans, though by no means all of them, Existentially, this is the first disturbing suggestion uh, that in some in some respects Hitler did mirror the German people, and um, and and that's a problem. That's a serious problem that uh, that Germans need to come to terms with. He thinks, and, and um, but but though he represents them existentially, he does so without regard to transcendence. In no way does he represent a higher moral order or justice, right? Um, he has the authority, he had the authority of power, uh, but not of right. Um, and here you can look at um, what Bogdan says about Justinian's three sources of authority uh, on pages 78, uh, 79 and uh, 80. Um, so Bogdan concludes about this question of representation, that the task for ourselves, he's speaking to his audience, speaking to Germans at the time, that the task for us is to prevent ourselves from becoming contemptible, like those who fell for Hitler. That's how he puts it, contemptible. Um, in other words, 
and if you want to broaden this to political science more generally, um, the problem is how do we um, become the kind of people who stand against uh, the evils of society rather than um, being part of the problem, right? Um, and uh, above all, how we avoid being taken in and following um, bad people. Um, the third cliche that he takes up, it, uh, well, it's, it's a combination of cliches, and that is um, the idea of state and democracy, right? The Germans have been influenced by Hegel a lot, and Hegelian philosophy, and other trends in German philosophy that understood the state in very abstract terms. So, so Hegel's, Hegel presented the state as an embodiment of the ethical idea. And Bergman thinks that's not helpful at all for coming to terms with concrete political realities. Bergman says uh, the, the way we should be thinking about the German state uh, at the time is people acting in government. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about some abstract embodiment of an ideal thing. We're talking about actual people acting in government, right? And in terms of democracy, too, um, you know, the Germans were trying to uh, reestablish a democratic state at the time. But um, Bogan thinks that they're, they're thinking about democracy superficially either just as a form of government, you know, the many ruling rather than one or a few, or an ideal uh, um, that, uh, you know, might be achievable in practice. And Vogelin wants to suggest that democracy properly understood or in, in its healthy form is, is um, uh, an unrealizable ideal, right? It's a it's a valuable ideal. It's something to try to live up to uh, as much as possible, but it's an unrealizable ideal. I mean, the ideal of democracy is the full participation by every person in society uh, on the basis of being well informed, engaged, and virtuous, right? Right? Or being you know, people who have uh, you know, sort of the the sensibleness and the moral uh, fiber to uh, to be able to uh, direct society uh, uh, as a collection of individuals and, and you know that, that's just not uh, realizable that, that, that will never happen um, so what is it really concretely what what is democracy or at least democracy in the healthy sense and Vogelin wants to suggest that it's an imperfect, messy process uh, that uh, at best involves prudence and compromise um, and a willingness to play by the rules, you know, to accept um, uh, the, uh, not only the, uh, you know, the result of elections, but to accept uh, the outcome of the legislative processes and uh, judicial processes, right? Um, and and also uh, for democracy to work, um, uh, you cannot press one good at the expense of all other goods. Right. So democracy is this messy process of sort of you know, uh, people uh, muddling through and trying to. Um, uh, not only represent the people, but try to uh, do something good for society. Uh, but uh, you know, if they're if they're trying to replace uh, the Nazi state with some kind of ideal democracy, um, that's not going to happen either. So uh, you know, in general, you could say Vogelin wants to get much more concrete um, in thinking about um, in talking about uh, these these uh, these issues that they're they're considering and uh, so he's he's ditching these cliches we're not going to talk 
um, abstractly about the state and democracy. We're going to talk about concretely about what people are doing and how they're doing it. Um, but um, okay, so uh, but uh, he says you're getting uh, you're getting more concrete. But in terms of the criterion of judgment, uh, we need to get much more concrete about this idea of. Uh, um, judging under the divine presence, right? Uh, that sounds that sounds uh, not only unfamiliar but but pretty vague. And Voigtlin says that the, the concrete standard here is the healthy man. Um, so what is what is he getting at here? Well, first of all, he defines man in the classic sense. I think moderns have touch with what man is. Um, they, 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 they think, I mean, humanity, right, not male uh, versus female, but man as humanity. In the classic sense, um, meaning in the ancient Greco-Roman and then Christian understanding, man was the animal capable of being ordered by reason and spirit. Oglin uses the terms nous, um, that's the phonetic uh, rendering of, of the Greek word for reason that's used by Plato and Aristotle and it's used by Christian uh, thinkers. Um, and and uh, for spirit, the, the term that's used in the New Testament, pneuma. Um, and 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 so, uh, but but as I mentioned in the first lecture, um, this the, the notion of reason involved here was something very different from the modern notion, and um, and therein lies a great deal of the problem in understanding man. Um, this animal capable of being ordered by reason and spirit, by noose and pneuma, uh, what that meant was capable of having a disciplined orientation toward what Vogelin calls the ground of being, the ground of existence, the ultimate source of, uh, of our lives and meaning, or at least uh, the potential source, um, by which he means God. Um, so to put it in uh, Greek terms, um, Plato and Aristotle understood the ultimate aim of philosophy to get to the arche, uh, which means the the uh, origin or uh, source of existence. And <clears throat> um, Aristotle, followed by St. Thomas Aquinas, um, understood this in terms of uh, concept. Uh, there are many ways they approach this, but one of them that's helpful here, I think, is uh, the con concept of a first mover um, or a first cause. So if you're looking out the world and you're saying, uh, you know, what, what caused all this to be the way it is, um, the, uh, you know, you, you say, well, it was caused by this natural, well, you say in the modern context, uh, at least, this was caused by this natural process, and that that was caused by another natural uh, natural process, and and so on. But uh, but uh, philosophically, um, well, what's the first cause? You push back the causes, the sequence of causes, all the way back to the beginning. What caused the whole chain of causes? Well, it, it had to have been, um, rationally speaking. An uncaused cause, right? Um, and the way Aquinas puts it, this is what we call God. Um, so, uh, uh, so, and man is the creature that can relate to this, think about this, connect uh, with this. Uh, the the classic formulation. Uh, that was put forth by the philosopher Schelling um, was in terms of two 
fundamental questions about reality, the most fundamental questions of philosophy. Number one, why is there something rather than nothing? And number two, why is the something the way it is and not something else? Um, these are the most fundamental questions. And these bring you down to the questions of reality itself, um, the sources of reality itself. So, okay, let me illustrate. Um, I think uh, this is still fairly abstract. Um, and Vogelin is keen to get to the concrete of this. Let's start with Plato's myth of the, pub uh, of the puppet player. Notice, we're talking about Christianity, so the ideas here um, are, are not specifically religious in the way we usually think about them, right? Um, in Plato's Laws, his last book, his longest book, he, um, the, there's this old man talking about um, the ideal society, and they raise this question of human nature and what man is like, and so forth. And uh, one of them, the Athenian stranger, he's called. It's one of the few dialogues that Socrates has no place in. And uh, uh, often people think that the Athenian stranger was Plato finally speaking in his own voice. Um, but uh, this Athenian stranger says, well, it seems like man is, is kind of like a puppet pulled by many strings. And um, um, he's pulled downward, so to speak, towards his baser instincts by steely cords of passion that are very violent. And they're always pulling him down to the lower things. Take the metaphor from him. Um, but then there is also this golden cord of reason that pulls man upward towards higher things, towards more noble things, <coughs> towards things like justice um, and high ideals and so forth. So it looks sort of like this, if you want to represent it. There's this, okay, so this, this is this, the soul, which is just, uh, I didn't have a lot of theological baggage at this point, the idea of the soul is just that uh, that source of life within us um, and that part in us that reasons and wills and so forth. And here, this is the soul um, uh, being pulled down by steely cords of passion here, right? Um, and pulled upward by the golden cord of reason. So there's a tension within human beings uh, uh, between these various poles, right? And the secret of living well, uh, the Athenian stranger suggests, is to counter pull against those steely cords of passion, which are so violent, which are pulling you to baser things, and to allow yourself to be pulled by the golden cord of reason, which he uh, speculates uh, uh, may be pulled by some god. Um, so if you want to put this in terms of, um, you know, listening to the better angels of our nature or what have you, but human beings live in this tension. Um, and um, Plato ha actually had a technical term for this in another dialogue he used called a metaxy, M-E-T-A-X-Y, if you're going to anglify it. Um, this means in the in-between. Man lives in the in-between. Um, so this is the state of man, and uh, what's distinctive about uh, man as related, uh, as compared to other animals, is that all, all the animals have this part. They don't have this part. Um, and this is this is noose, the orientation towards uh, the the divine pull, uh, or um, Christians call it faith um, and spirit is is that in us that is responsive to this so same, same with reason if you want to talk about it as a uh, 
instead of uh, just an experience as, as a capacity within us. It's that capacity to be oriented towards the divine ground of being. So that's how Plato puts it um, in the laws. In the uh, Republic, uh, he gives this allegory of the cave, which is more famous, uh, which uh, you've looked at in this class. Um, remember, in the cave image, uh, it's, a, it's an allegory of the education of man, uh, or, or it's a picture of, of human nature in his ignorance and education. That's how Socrates introduces the, the allegory. And uh, you remember the, the elements of the allegory. It's very memorable, probably. You haven't forgotten it yet. But in the allegory, uh, this, this, this man who's broken free and out of the world of shadows uh, arises outside of the cave into the light of um, being. The realm of becoming, the, the shadowy realm, uh, was that it, it corresponded to that realm of the passions and uh, you know, human nature was dominated by passions but uh, the man transcends from this or he is pulled it says he is there the, there is a there is a pull um helkine is the the greek word uh something pulls him and he actually is not comfortable with this at all this is a very disorienting process um, to realize that rea what he thought was reality was was really uh, was not not only not the sum total of reality, but not the highest reality, not the most important reality. Um, and he's pulled sort of kicking and screaming on the way up, but he emerges from the cave and he sees uh, this world of the mind, the world of the spirit, um, uh, is is what he has entered into, and he recognizes that ultimately. Uh, Everything is illuminated in this upper world by the sun, which represents the idea of the good, which he calls the divine good, the, the being beyond all being, um, the ultimate uh, super reality. Uh, literally, the Greek is the being, um, the being that is beingly being, um, and is the source of all being, and is what gives meaning to all being, just as the sun is necessary to sustain life on earth. Cave allegory. Uh, in the Christian context, the, uh, the rough equivalent uh, to this experience of ascent uh, was faith. Um, pistis. Uh, uh, later translated fides. Uh, by the uh, Latins, um, and um, and Vogelin thinks this this concept of faith has been badly misunderstood in the modern context as well, including by religious people. Um, and he looks at the classic text on uh, the definition of faith in the New Testament, in Hebrews eleven one. Hebrews 11 one goes like this. I'll render it in the King James because in this case, the King James is quite precise uh, in capturing the Greek uh, uh, meaning. It goes like this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. That's it. It's not a list of propositions which one gives assent. Uh, it's more harder to grasp thing. So what does it mean? Well, it says faith is a substance. Whenever I ask my students what, what a substance is, uh, usually I'll get um, something like it's, it's something tangible. And what they mean is something real that you can uh, that you can touch, or smell, or whatever. And and I say, yes, it's something real, but this is an intangible reality. Um, I think, uh, certainly Vogelin thinks, 
what's being spoken of here is an experience, an experience of some great good that awakens hope. Right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And as an experience, it's something real. Well, it could be interpreted in various ways. But uh, what cannot be denied is that there is a certain class of experience um, symbolized by this term faith that uh, is, is, is in the literature, is in uh, people's accounts of what they have experienced. It might be interpreted various ways. Uh, it might not even be seen uh, particularly as religious, but this kind of experience, this reaching out in hope for uh, some mysterious experienced presence, if you will, um, is the root of it. And the second part, uh, faith is the evidence of things unseen. What is the evidence that you've experienced the divine here, some divine reality? There is no evidence but the experience itself. And that's all you're going to get. But it's concrete, it's something real. Um, and it corresponds roughly to the philosophic impulse. Um, uh, is what Berglund suggests, right? Um, there was a, um, a, a Christian philosopher named uh, Anselm uh, who defined philosophy in a nutshell formula, fides quarens intellectum, which means faith questing after or seeking understanding. And so the idea was uh, uh, you, you have uh, this experience and you're trying to understand its significance. Um, Socrates touches on this in Platonic Dialogues as uh, in terms of you're seeking some kind of understanding uh, the, the meaning of reality or the good as he uh, often speaks of it. Um, but you don't know exactly what it is you're thinking. This seems like a par I mean, what, what you're seeking seems like a paradox. Uh, how do you know to seek it if you don't know what it is? Um, and uh, you know, to put it in, in, in Christian terms, uh, in Saint Anselm is well, you follow out the experience like Plato suggested. You realize that you have been you're being pulled, drawn by. The divine beyond. Um, so man is this creature that can have this kind of experience, who can have this kind of orientation, and who can order himself, order his life in response and responsiveness to this. Right. It's in this specific concrete sense that Vogelin is saying, um, here is our concrete standard by which we will judge things. Um, what specifically is going wrong, of course he's going to elaborate this and provide evidence for this as his analysis goes along, but what's specifically going wrong with a guy like Hitler and with the people who followed Hitler um, is a, an alienation from this experience. Um, so that there is a defection, as he puts it, from reason and spirit, which is what makes us human. So there is a dehumanization that comes along with this. And so the process of descent into the abyss uh, uh, that, that, that Nazi Germany was uh, starts with a, a kind of denial of reason and spirit, closing yourself off from it, right, which results in a kind of, he calls it uh, another place, de-divinization, where that divine element in man, the divine connection, or the, uh, man's connection with the divine is cut off, um, and, and man is dehumanized. And fundamentally, there is a loss of reality, the most important reality. Um, and the replacement of that reality 
with what Bogum calls a second reality, a made-up reality, and this is the modern term for this is ideology. Um, so Vogelin says, okay, we can we can develop um, human typology according to three types. He appeals to Hesiod, the, the great uh, Greek philosopher Hesiod, uh, who was around oh, roughly the time of Homer. And Hesiod says there's three kinds of men, right? Uh, there is there is the man capable of directing himself according to reason, news. Bogan says reason and spirit. Second, there is the type who can be directed by such a person, who could recognize the the nobility of of and the, the wisdom of this person, uh, directed according to reason and spirit. And then there is a third who can do neither, who can neither direct himself by reason and spirit, nor uh, uh, allow himself to be directed by someone like this. And Hesiod's term for this was, the Greek was idiote, um, a man without sense, um, and therefore the connotation came to be worthless. The, the, this, this kind of person uh, can, can contribute no good. Um, and it's this specific link uh, that Vogelin has in mind to this concept of stupidity. Right. He says the fundamental problem in Germany was stupidity uh, in relation to uh, Hitler. Uh, but he did not mean by this intellectual incapacity. What we usually mean by st stupidity is um, in inability to recognize the obvious, right? Either because you're mentally uh, incapable or uh, because hmm, you've been blinded by some passion or, or whatever, right? And, but in this case, Bogun is talking about blindness to reason and spirit, blindness to this experience, this connection. Uh, with the divine, right? Um, a reality that everyone can experience, that is in fact there at all times, but uh, um, one is incapable of coming to grips with. Um, and then there's the problem, he says, notice he's developing a, a technical um, terminology here that he thinks helps us come concretely to terms with things. And then there is the problem of illiteracy, right? And illiteracy means uh, that uh, if you're illiterate in this sense that he's talking about, he's not talking about inability to read, he's talking about inability to comprehend the language of reason and spirit. In the modern context, people no longer understood words like reason and spirit as originally used by the ancients. Um, they no longer understood uh, the symbol faith. Um, it meant something different. And, uh, and increasingly the old symbols seemed nonsensical to them because they lacked that connection um, experientially with the higher dimension. Um, so this stupidity, which is inability to uh, recognize reason and spirit, to recognize the experience, right? And there is the literacy, the inability to even understand the language by which people talked about such experiences, right? And then he gets down to um, some of the more serious issues. Uh, he, he adopts the English... Um, legal concept of alibi. Talk about how people justified the wrongdoing um, of uh, their own wrongs um, among the Nazis, right? Um, it was justifying, and here's the corrupt aspect of it, a willful blindness. 
they they were coming up with um, some kind of excuse to explain away what they were responsible for, right? Um, and and Bergman uh, says, well, what is at the root of this? And he uses a term coined by I think it was Schelling uh, again, pneumopathology is at the root of this. I've heard of psychopathology. Psycho a psychopath is someone who has, um, in a sense, lost touch with reality, right? Um, and uh, has lost um, contact with conscience. Um, and he says this goes deeper than some kind of uh, intellectual problem like that. It's not clinical insanity uh, that 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 uh, somebody like Hitler. Uh, that, that wasn't his problem. Uh, it's not like he had a psychological disorder that uh, rendered him capable of uh, seeing everyday reality. Uh, he was capable, quite capable, of instrumental reasoning and logical reasoning to think about uh, how to get from point A to point B. In particular, he was brilliant at thinking about how to acquire power. Right. Um, but he was irrational in this specific sense, right? And radically stupid in this specific sense that uh, his spirit was diseased. Pneumo comes from pneuma, spirit. He said it, pathology, disease, a disease of the spirit, right? It goes deeper than psychology. Um, it goes to the will, something that the will itself has been corrupted. Um, and when this is pneumopathology is united with power, the term Berglund uses is criminal stupidity. Um, it's criminal in that um, not only that, that it results in um, crimes against humanity, as we've come to call it, but but that it's it involves a willful blindness. There is an element of deliberate deception and self-deception about it um, and what that means will will develop um, and then Vogelin here you know makes this this uh, side to the audience uh, uh, understand there is no right to be stupid no one is, has an excuse for this kind of stupidity right um, and then so getting down to the root of this pneumopathology uh, as I suggested, it's in the will. Uh, uh, it's a kind of will to power. The, the, the term he uses uh, is a technical term used by Augustine, which was in the Latin, libido dominandi, the lust for domination. This is what drove Hitler. And this is what attracted people who followed Hitler. Um, the will to power in this sense, and uh, Vogelin points out that this this is this represents a radical departure from the ancients' understanding of will. Will was by definition something that's rationally ordered. Uh, when one loses touch with reason, noose, uh, and spirit, pneuma, um, either one becomes incapable of uh, choosing the good, choosing the noble, and so forth. But it begins with a quite willing, in terms of deliberate, in terms of um, giving yourself over to this lust for power, right? And, uh, and, and a, a great line he uses, I uh, can't remember who he's quoting, Bergman uses to describe this, the essence of the libido dominandi, is the world shall be as I wish it. It's a, it's a lust not only to dominate other human beings, but to dominate reality in a fundamental sense. I, I assert my will that reality will be the way I want it to be rather than what it is, right? And this is what Vogelin calls the second reality, right? Construction of a system, 
as he puts it. Right. This is the ideology. Construction of a system to, uh, to will a new world into place. Right. The world as it is, you don't like. Uh, you can't accept. Um, the post-World War I situation, you can't come to terms with, in terms of the, the, the situation in German society. Um, so you want to escape into this magic bullet panacea solution of a system. Right. It's the second reality. And what this means is essentially, and so the motive of it is the world shall be as I wish it. In other words, a will to power over reality, a libido dominandi. Right. And this involves, Kirkland suggests, and this is crucial, a will to swindle. A deliberate willful blindness, a shutting oneself off from that voice of reason, that higher calling, that pull of the golden cord, right? Um, the better angel of our nature, there are lots of ways to express it. But if you deliberately shut yourself off from that, a, a nice um, episode, uh, uh, illust illustrative episode in the case of Hitler. Uh, one of his biographers that Folkman very much admires, uh, admired uh, a guy named Alan Bullock, wrote a book called Hitler, A Study in Tyranny. And uh, there's, there's a, a particular episode where um, Hitler tells his generals uh, when they're about to go do um, some campaign, Close your hearts to mercy, he says. Now, for Hitler, that's almost a throwaway line, but it's a very revealing line. To say, close your hearts to mercy, suggests that you know what mercy is, and you deliberately choose to reject it. Right. This is the libido dominandi. And to justify and enable what you want to do, you create an ideology that allows you to exert your will and to maintain this deliberate illusion. You close your heart to the higher pull of transcendence. Okay. Chapter 2. Pick up Chapter 3 next time. See ya.